You all have a beautiful country here, so I'm very, very happy to be here, and I appreciate the hospitality. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the possible role that cognition might play in internet navigation behavior. And to state the patently obvious, uh, as you all know better than maybe anyone, the internet has really revolutionized the way that we do almost everything in our everyday lives. So with the widespread availability of high-speed internet, uh, it's becoming increasingly prevalent uh, in virtually uh, all households, uh, certainly in the, in the western, uh, western part of the world. And scientists have obviously caught on to that fact and have been increasingly interested in studying the way that people are using the internet um, uh, and both, uh, uh, both in terms of health outcomes um, as well as more of the uh, basic approaches to uh, understanding computer science behind these things. And because people are using it more and more, we're interested in what they're using it for. And as a clinical psychologist, I'm particularly interested in the way that people are using the internet to manage their daily activities. And what we know so far is that people largely use the internet for communication-based purposes in this, uh, in this day and age, um, but also for an increasing number of activities of daily living. Right? So these are the things that we do independently uh, to get through our daily lives. So things like shopping, managing your finances, and also doing health-related activities. So health research, um, we're getting uh, now uh, messages from our health providers where we're logging in to electronic medical re records portals, interpreting lab results. We're doing more and more on the web that we used to do face-to-face. So this is particularly true for people who are living with a variety of uh, health-related conditions. And I'm a clinical neuropsychologist by training, and so I'm especially interested in those with neurological diseases that affect cognition. And so our patients we see are increasingly using the internet to find health information, providers, those who are lucky enough to have insurance have to log on to very complex insurance websites to find the right provider who fits their, uh, their particular need and also takes their insurance. We're scheduling appointments, we're confirming appointments online, we're using our smartphones to confirm and schedule appointments, we're communicating with providers as I mentioned. Um, I, I'm a little bit slow to this game myself even though I do this research, so I just sent my doctor an email the other day which I'd never ever done before in my life. Uh, and we're reviewing test results and managing, uh, managing healthcare online. So even for me as a relatively well-educated mildly tech savvy gentlemen, I oftentimes get confused by these websites and by these communications and where do I go and how do I find this information, much less than how do I understand it and make sense out of it in terms of my own care. So you can imagine that persons with neurocognitive disorders would have an increasingly difficult time navigating these sorts of, uh, these sorts of approaches. <clears throat> so, um, but so we know that, uh, that neurocognitive disorders are increasingly prevalent as well, particularly among older adults. And by neurocognitive disorders, we mean patients that show deficits in uh, at least two or more areas of cognition, so things like memory, attention, problem solving, <clears throat> that interfere with their everyday lives in some meaningful way. So you can see here the prevalence of mild neurocognitive disorders increases with age and major, which uh, we used to call dementia, but now we call major neurocognitive disorders, um, is, also, uh, is also on the rise. So these are the people who you can imagine need these types of services the most, but might have difficulty with these sorts of interfaces. And we know that neurocognitive failures can interfere with non-internet related health behavior. So this has been a large focus of my research historically. Um, we know that patients with neurocognitive disorders have difficulty managing their medications independently. They have difficulty actually adhering to those medications independently. They're more likely to drop out of care uh, than those who have, uh, have neurocognition intact. And they also have deficits in health literacy. So this is a, a small meta-analysis that we did uh, looking at the magnitude of those effects for uh, particular domains. And we know that memory and executive functions tend to be the strongest predictors of these sorts of daily activities. And so by memory, we mean learning and delayed recall of word lists, stories, uh, figures, uh, and executive functions is a huge umbrella category that includes things like planning, decision making, divided attention, uh, and such. So those are the two domains that we see most robustly predict having problems in your everyday life. And that makes good intuitive sense, right? If you're having difficulty learning and remembering things in the lab, it makes sense that you would have difficulty learning and remembering to do things in your everyday life. And so if we apply that to how those sorts of deficits could interfere with internet-based healthcare, 
You can imagine that basic psychomotor skills or motor deficits could interfere with the way that people um, use the mouse uh, and, uh, and keyboard, um, uh, how quickly they're able to process information as it's coming at them. Uh, the spatial navigation uh, deficits, so your visual perception um, can influence the way that you're perceiving the stimuli. Uh, memory, uh, uh, forgetting passwords, which is a, a thing that, uh, that all of us do all the time. I could be projecting my own issues here, but uh, certainly something that I, I, I certainly experience, um, as well as attention and executive function. So inhibiting distractions like advertisements or, uh, or other sorts of uh, clickbait, problem solving non-intuitive sites, um, this is especially true, uh, and, and uh, I pay attention to this in, in the healthcare setting and on insurance sites, which are oftentimes very uh, confusing to navigate, even for those of us who allegedly know what we're doing. And then finally, even judging the reliability and integrity of a site. So how uh, scientifically based or data-driven is the information that you're getting about these health conditions? Are you, uh, are you looking at an NIH uh, log that is showing you information from a series of clinical trials, or are you looking at Jim's blog who gives you opi his opinion about, uh, about a certain condition? So uh, there's a variety of ways in which neurocognition uh, could influence the way that we navigate and understand information on the web. And so some early work into this, uh, LeBurge and Schalfa in 2005 were the first uh, folks to, uh, to really study this in a lifespan approach. It was a very small sample and they gave uh, their uh, healthy participants a, a small battery of neurocognitive tests in the lab. And then they also had them do a, a search paradigm. So they had them uh, search the internet for some health related information. And then they coded how long it took them uh, to do that. Uh, and then uh, how many pages they navigated to find the information. And what they discovered that was uh, vocabulary, uh, so uh, our semantic knowledge was not strongly related to the way that people navigated the internet, but uh, spatial skills, working memory, and processing speed all showed fairly large effect sizes, particularly with the time per trial. So uh, the longer it took patients to find this information, the worse they performed in the laboratory. And that image didn't come up, uh, unfortunately, but this was a, a very beautiful brain picture uh, earlier that showed uh, there was a, uh, one imaging study out there <clears throat> in which they had people uh, search the internet for information and then compared it to a standard reading paradigm. And what they found was that the internet search behavior after controlling for basic reading skills was associated with activation in the frontal pole, which is involved in higher order cognition, things like executive functions that I mentioned earlier. The right anterior temporal cortex, which is involved in semantic memory, so your store of knowledge or fund of knowledge, as well as the cingulate cortex, uh, which is involved in decision making and cognitive control, and the bilateral hippocampus, which plays a role in episodic memory. So you can start to see a little bit of convergence of evidence from what we think might go on in terms of just your general face validity about the internet use and how cognition would play a role, to what this early data was showing, at least for internet search paradigms. And then if we link that back to what we know about how cognition influences other aspects of everyday life, we can start to see the focus on memory and executive functions as being potentially important for the way that we navigate the internet. Uh, this is for over 60. What's that? This is for age over 60, this chart. Uh, that chart, no. Uh, no. This chart here? Yeah. No, this was lifespan. This was uh, across lifespan. These are 18 to 60, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the first uh, folks to do this in a more uh, systematic way, I would argue, were John DeLuca and Yale Gover over at, uh, at the Kessler Institute uh, in Jersey. Um, and they developed uh, a very simple paradigm, which they called actual reality, in which they had their participants, and they've looked at both multiple sclerosis and traumatic brain injury, uh, log into an internet uh, carrier, Continental Airlines specifically, and they had them plan a trip. So they gave them instructions. We want you to log in. We want you to plan a trip over the summer. You're going to fly from New York to Florida, and you need to do it within a certain budget and within a certain time frame. Okay? And they had an examiner there that was coding the information, how long it took them, how many steps it took them to do, and how many errors that they made. And what they found in fairly small samples was that relative to healthy patients, individuals with multiple sclerosis, uh, made many more errors 
in this relatively simple internet-based paradigm in which they had the instructions in front of them the entire time. So this wasn't a memory task necessarily, this was really a functional capacity sort of a task. And these are uh, very large effect sizes. Uh, so Cohen's D of 1.1, uh, so Cohen's D values of 0.8 are generally considered large, so this is a very large effect size. <clears throat> And they also showed correlations between uh, these errors on the airline shopping task with measures of processing speed, so how quickly you're able to process information, uh, measures of uh, learning, in this case it was learning uh, both words and designs, executive functions, and spatial skills as well. So not only are we seeing that patients with neurologic disorders are struggling with this, but that within patients with neurological disorders, there's an association between cognition and their performance on this task. So nice. Uh, convergence of evidence there. And this is not the same slide, uh, but in fact this is a different population showing generally the same results. So this is a patient with traumatic brain injury, again fairly small samples, but very large effect sizes and strong correlations which were very consistent with the prior slide with the exception of spatial cognition, which you don't necessarily see as deficient in patients with, uh, with TBI. Yes? Did they talk about uh, participants not being able to complete the tasks? They effects would affect yeah I think effect. everybody was able to complete the task there was uh, the way that they coded it was that participants were able to get assistance throughout so they're uh, coming from a rehab background so this uh, these scores end up involving levels of assistance needed so everybody was able to complete it whether they could complete it independently they didn't report in any proportions along those lines but uh, but they, they took more of that rehab mindset towards how much assistance does one need to get this done so both patients with TBI uh, and those with multiple sclerosis needed much more assistance and made many errors, many more errors than uh, demographically matched uh, healthy controls. Uh, and the groups were also matched on internet experience and use, right? So that's not necessarily a confound in this case. There are some problems here. So they actually used the live internet, which introduces some error and some additional scoring burden, right? So you've got variability in a variety of different factors here plus the expense uh, of, uh, of an examiner. Uh, these are very small sample sizes. They didn't use any health or financial tasks. Um, and both of the studies, interestingly enough, uh, internet-based performance was not related to quality of life or everyday functioning. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why that might be, but we can get into that a little bit later. And of course, uh, so far this data is only limited to multiple sclerosis, TBI, and there's one MCI study out there. So can I follow up on that last yeah. statement? Wasn't that related to everyday functioning? Was that everyday functioning based on self-report? Uh, it's self-report, yeah. Yeah, the quality of life and everyday functioning is based on self-report, and these are tiny, tiny sample sizes. So the correlations would have had to have been uh, huge for them to be observed. There was one, one of their studies in TBI did show an association with uh, everyday functioning as measured by self-report, but it was also related to depression strongly and at about the same level. And the sample size wasn't big enough to decide which of those would win in a horse race. But my guess is that depression was driving it in that instance. But self-report as a functional outcome is hugely flawed, especially in neurologic populations where insight is, uh, is a huge issue. Okay, so our uh, so we got a small grant to develop a, a series of internet-based tasks to, uh, to further this research. And we were charged with developing uh, four different uh, real-world uh, scenarios. So a shopping scenario, um, and which I'll, I'll show you a, sh a short video of, uh, an online banking scenario, and then two health-related scenarios. One was a medical record scenario and the other mobile pharmacy. And again, I'll describe those in, in greater detail. When we got the grant, these two were up and running, and so the most of the data that I'll show you is related to these. Uh, and then these were developed in the course of year one, and then we deployed and piloted them in year two, so that's a slightly smaller sample size. So we decided to do this among uh, persons who were uh, living with HIV disease, um, and uh, there's a variety of reasons why we decided to do this. One, one was that we were interested in chronic medical conditions in which cognition is an issue, and HIV fit that bill. Um, so it, among HIV positive persons, um, uh, correlates of internet use I don't think are terribly unique. So it's associated with younger age, uh, Caucasian ethnicity, higher socioeconomic status. Um, and then on the back side, greater health related social support. So if people have somebody 
um, that they can rely on for uh, taking them to doctor's appointments or helping them schedule, remember to take their medications, they're more likely to use the internet. Um, on the medical biomarker side, uh, it's associated with better outcomes. So patients who use the internet more often for health related purposes are more likely to have undetectable viral load, which is the primary endpoint for HIV therapy. And not, uh, not surprisingly, they're also more likely to adhere to their, uh, to their medications. Uh, so internet navigation difficulties could represent some serious barriers for these folks, and about two-thirds of HIV-positive individuals require some assistance in using the internet, and those tend to be from lower SES uh, backgrounds, they tend to be older, non-Caucasian, and have inadequate health literacy. So I run a one-day-a-week clinic at an HIV hospital in, uh, in, in Houston, um, and these are the patients that we see. So it's a county hospital, it's a free clinic, uh, and these are the patients that we see on, on a regular basis who very much struggle uh, with, with technology use. Mm -hmm. HIV, as many people do not necessarily know, is also associated with a high prevalence of neurocognitive disorders. So about half of patients living with HIV have a neurocognitive disorder. Uh, HIV actually infiltrates brain structure and function within hours of infection. Um, the virus tends to compartmentalize into different organ systems, and the brain is one of those organ systems into which it compartmentalizes. So half of patients have uh, cognitive disorders. That mostly tends to be um, mild cognitive disorders, so mild to moderate impairment, and the impairment tends to affect memory and executive functions. So another reason why we thought this would be a good population. Only uh, about Two to five percent of patients with HIV have frank dementia, so dementia that even a layperson would be able to notice, um, which has gone down considerably in the era of effective antiretroviral therapy, but the prevalence of milder neurocognitive disorders has actually gone up as people are living longer with the disease, so we thought it was a relevant group. Um, if an individual is able to keep their viral load low, are they yeah. still having yeah, so uh, HIV has a horrible time identifying a biomarker of impairment because the pathology is incredibly diverse. So about 15% have viral specific pathology, um, but you also get Alzheimer type 2 gliosis, you get vascular pathology, you get other infectious pathology. Um, so there's not a strong relationship between viral load, CD4 count, and cognition, unfortunately, in HIV. Um, that's a whole nother lecture. <laughs> okay, so our aims were to determine whether or not patients with HIV-associated cognitive disorders uh, struggle to use the internet for health behaviors and activities of daily living. And we also wanted to look at the clinical demographic correlates of those things. Uh, we enrolled 135 participants. Uh, and these data were collected uh, in 2013 and 2014. We ended up with 42 negatives and 93 positives uh, from 18 to 70 and about half of our positives were diagnosed with a cognitive disorder, so we thought that this was pretty representative. Study exclusions were pretty typical for a neuroaid study, so no other conditions that could affect cognition. Uh, we excluded patients with psychosis or who had active drug use. Um, and then we struggled with this last one. I went back and forth with reviewers a little bit, but we landed at, uh, if they had used the internet less than five times in the last year, we excluded them. There was some push towards including patients who had not used the internet because they may be not using it because they can't. Uh, by the same token, we're also interested in developing some instruments that could be useful for future work. So we set the limit, uh, we set the limit at five. And here's what they looked like. On average, they were in their mid-40s, uh, mostly men, which is consistent with the, uh, with the HIV epidemic. Uh, largely Caucasian, this was a San Diego sample, and their estimated premorbid IQ was solidly average. So average IQ is 100, standard deviation is 15. Sir? What does hand mean? What hand means? Uh, HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder. Yeah, so this is the, uh, th these are the HIV negative folks. So these are HIV positive persons who don't have global cognitive disorder, and those are HIV positive persons with a global cognitive disorder. And so it's a three group design. One weird thing about this work is that our HIV negatives are not healthy controls. So we include patients who are demographically and socially comparable to our HIV positive persons. So they have, as I'll show you here, uh, this is a perfect transition. They do have histories of lifetime major depressive disorder and anxiety. Uh, almost half of them had histories of substance use disorders. So we tried to get a bead on the HIV signal as much as we could, right? There's so much noise that travels with HIV infection in terms of comorbidities, hepatitis C, 
uh, and other things that can affect brain structure and function, that we want a comparison group, not a healthy control group. It's easy to find differences relative to a healthy control group. It's much harder to find them relative to people who are, uh, who are comparable and have a bunch of other risk factors going on. Uh, in terms of their HIV disease severity itself, they have been infected for about 12 years. Most of them had AIDS. AIDS diagnoses are immutable, meaning once you get them, they never go away, even if you become healthy later. So that's not a good reflection of their current uh, state of health. This is their current CD4 count. It's 700. That doesn't differ from controls. These are very healthy HIV persons in terms of their immune compromise. Um, <clears throat> so below 500 is considered worrisome. Below 200 is clinical. Most were prescribed uh, antiretroviral therapies, and very few had detectable uh, virus in their blood, uh, which, makes, which makes good sense. Uh, so we drew them from a variety of places, and we gave them a pretty comprehensive battery. Uh, you can see here there were some differences in the extent to which they had a, a home computer, so the hand group, uh, the patients with cognitive disorders, were less likely to have a home computer. Uh, they were less likely to own a smartphone. They used the internet less often. Uh, they also used the internet slightly less often for their ADLs and had more difficulty and anxiety related to the internet. So throughout the next series of analyses that you're gonna see, we either adjusted for these things or ruled them out as confounding factors. So this was interesting to me in and of itself just to see that independent of anything else, our hand patients by virtue of self-report were having some struggles using the internet, <clears throat> but because we don't want that to confound our performance-based analyses, we either again adjusted for it or ruled it out that it wasn't related to our performance-based metrics. So let's start with the other self-report stuff. So sources of knowledge and self-efficacy for health-related information. Um, so uh, the averages here didn't differ across the board. So uh, patients uh, use the uh, internet and non-internet sources about the same to find their health related information so it's not just that everybody was only using the internet they obviously get their health information from social networks and uh, and television and other places uh, and that didn't differ across uh, sarah status um, they didn't differ in terms of whether they thought the internet was useful for health related information so they all agreed that it was something that was worth pursuing and they didn't differ in terms of their self-efficacy in finding non-internet based health information but there was a significant effect for the hand patients who were less confident in their ability to find information on the web. So, and this interaction was, uh, was in fact significant. So they expressed, this is the e-heels, they expressed more difficulty finding, accessing, and understanding health-related information uh, on the internet. And what we observed was that neurocognition uh, as a global metric uh, this relationship was mediated by both their health literacy, so this is traditional measures like their uh, word reading skills, uh, numeracy, those sorts of things, as well as their uh, overall functional impairment. Right? So it's a little bit hard to run a, a mediation model in a small sample size like this, but that's all we got. But both were significant, and in fact, if you put them both in the same model, they're both independent mediators of this relationship. So we think that this association is going through uh, known deficits in patients with hand, which is lower, uh, lower health literacy overall. So this is not health illiteracy necessarily, but just lower health literacy, as well as greater everyday functioning impairment. So this includes a composite, which was self-report activities of daily living, uh, clinician-based rating of their overall performance, whether or not they were employed, um, and the extent to which they had cognitive complaints. It was a global composite of those things. So we think that this relationship um, does in fact tie back to important functional things. So that's the self-report data. More interesting to me is the extent to which hand might affect actual internet navigation uh, capacity. So thanks to a wonderful team of programmers at UCSD, we were able to develop four naturalistic but experimenter controlled websites. So we did these from scratch and in-house. Participants logged into these websites using mock credentials that we gave them. Uh, they navigated the website independently to complete normal daily household and health tasks, and the instructions were in front of them the whole time, right? So we wanted this to be as natural as we could. If you think back to that first search study that I presented to you, it took patients longer to find the information. Eh, so it took them a little bit longer, big deal, right? We wanted a naturalistic setting that's outcomes focused, is can you actually do these things if you're given every opportunity to do so? Uh, so what the first paradigm we'll describe to you is an online shopping paradigm. 
Offline, we know that patients with hand have difficulties with, uh, with internet-based shopping. And in our study, there were no differences in participant experience with online home shopping specifically. We developed the online uh, shopping task, which we called SMART. Um, so patients were to log in, place eight items that we, again, this was in front of them, in a virtual cart. So these were things like toiletries, a uh, shirt for a job interview. Um, one item switches midway through the task. So we had an instant message up and they would have to pay attention to those instant messages. And I forget who it was, but it was their aunt or their grandma would come on and say, oh, by the way, can you get me this instead? So they had to pay attention to it and monitor that. They had to stay within a predetermined budget and then check out using a mock credit card and associated personal information. So let me show you this. I actually did it. There we go. Uh, so this was the home page, and this is what I was talking to Diane about a little bit early. We developed this, I think, in 2012, and at the time, it felt super badass. Uh, and looking at it now, it feels really dated. Uh, so one of the challenges that I experienced personally is if we're going to develop these sorts of tasks and standardize them and use them prospectively, uh, how do we then update them and keep them modern and not looking like they were developed 20 years ago? So here's an example of the shopping. So this was a, uh, a website that was both uh, deep and wide and we put original information in it. Uh, there's a variety of categories that they can go to. There's electronics, clothing, paper cleaning, home, and gifts. Um, this is an example of one of my RAs going through it. We also included some pop-ups to make them mad and distract them. And you see how old it is. Avatar at the time was, uh, was supposed to be the distracting movie. <clears throat> Patients add things to their cart. These are the instant messages that would come up. Um, so they would have to, uh, to be alert to them popping up. Uh, and there's the one that, uh, I think it's Auntie, that says, would you please buy me a new MP3, MP3 player? Again, how dated is this now? Uh, and then they put all this into their virtual shopping cart where they could modify it as they see fit. Once they were happy with it, we had the tax and the total. Uh, they then went to uh, the next page, uh, there's another little, a little distractor where they would check out. We gave them uh, a wallet that included uh, several credit cards and we had them use one specific card. There was an ID, there was a health insurance card, which they would use for some of the other tasks that we'll describe later. So it served as their uh, source of information um, throughout. So the, and the, the banking cards were linked to the actual banking task that we'll talk about, to talk about in a minute. Uh, so then they can select their payment uh, and check out. So that's the basic idea uh, of, that, of that task. And so all of the tasks are similar in that sense. Okay. So what did we see? First and foremost, we had a huge, much higher than expected failure rates in our HIV positive hand group. So these odds ratios were about uh, 10 to 12 overall, meaning the patients with hand were 10 to 12 times more likely to fail the task overall. We give a 40 minute time limit, which was based off of our pilot studies. Uh, so patients had 40 minutes to get through it. Uh, and only 75% uh, or so of our hand patients were able to do it. Our HIV negatives and uh, HIV positives without hands were able to do it pretty well. No significant differences among those that completed it in time to completion. So it's not just that patients were a little bit slow in getting through it. And when we look at the item analysis, we see that our patients with hand had difficulty with the initial registration, so logging in. Once again, this information is right in front of them along with the instructions. Uh, we also see that they did not, so they were less likely to get all the list items. They missed the item swap, so they missed that little pop-up message and were less likely to swap the item correctly. Virtually everybody stayed within budget and the rate of credit card errors and uh, distraction were relatively low, so it's mostly uh, the shopping items and specifically the item shop and registration that were driving these effects. We also see that it was related within the HIV group specifically to measures of cognition. So these are measures of attention and working memory. So uh, repeating digits back uh, orally. Not so much processing speed, a little bit different than the multiple sclerosis and TBI patients that we saw before, but we also see a little bit less of this in patients with HIV, so that makes sense strongly related to learning and memory. So these are large effect sizes. And again, instructions in front of them the whole time. So despite that fact, we're seeing strong relationships with their ability to learn new information. Not forgetting per se, but their ability to learn new information. And also executive functions and basic motor skills were related 
we also saw that it was related to their self-report of having shopping dependence in their everyday lives, um, as well as the OOPSA B, which is a performance-based measure of everyday functioning where we have them uh, manage some medications and go through kind of a mock communication with their, uh, with their provider, but not related to manifest everyday functioning in this case. So not related to uh, some of the other more general self-report measures of everyday functioning, but it was related to the specific problems with shopping, which is quite interesting. Uh, other correlates, fewer years of education, um, women did a little bit better, uh, and it also related to those self-reported computer use variables. But when we threw these in the model, the effects of, of the cognitive disorder didn't change. So it didn't, uh, uh, didn't mediate or moderate it. So then we tried the online banking task. This is a task in which we had them uh, transfer money from checking to pay an energy bill. They set up an automatic bill pay. Uh, we had them leave a specific balance in their checking. And then we also had them evaluate their account register to see erroneous transactions. And in there we had um, uh, one instance of eight different charges for the same thing. Okay, so it was a small charge, but they got, it looked like they got eight, eight, eight haircuts at Supercuts. Uh, and then they were supposed to send a message to customer support to try to rectify it. Once again, we see the patients with hands were uh, significantly lower. Everybody completed this on time. I think the average completion time was about five to 10 minutes. Um, but in terms of actual task completion, we saw overall effects that were driven by the hand group, and these were, again, uh, large effect sizes. Um, <clears throat> so we see a parallel evidence of household skills problems in patients with, uh, with neurocognitive disorders. And then the cooler part, in my opinion, is developing these online health records tasks. So this was a task that we wanted to mimic an electronic medical record. Patients had to log into the website to read their messages from their doctor, and we left it fairly unstructured in this case. So we said, check for any new lab results. If you receive any abnormal results, follow the instructions your doctor left in his note to you and schedule, and what that meant was, they don't know this, but what that meant was, was schedule a follow-up appointment in 30 days. So with this task, we were really worried about ceiling effects. So we tried to make this as intuitive as we possibly could, and uh, I was super afraid that we just weren't going to see any variability. So how did this differ? Well, uh, first of all, we start off with a bias in the opposite direction. So our HIV positive patients were more likely to have engaged with these sorts of systems than their HIV negative comparison subjects, right? It makes sense. They're in the healthcare system. So we start off with a little bit of a bias. And despite that bias, we see significant and large effects. So our hand and hand negative and HIV negative groups did relatively well. They got three out of four. Our hand positive group only got half of the items right. And this is a large effect size not accounted for by any of the variables that we've talked about. No differences in speed. In fact, the HIV uh, positive group with a cognitive disorder was, if anything, a little bit faster, maybe due to their familiarity with these sorts of interfaces, uh, but no significant differences in speed. In terms of item analysis, this is where I'm a little bit freaked out. Uh, across the board, only about 20% uh, total of the sample was able to schedule the appointment correctly. And this was a simple two-step, identify the doctor, pick a date, uh, pick a date task. So again, I was super worried about, about ceiling effects and everybody doing it right. Virtually nobody did it right, even though we designed it as simply as we could. Was it that they couldn't complete, or was it that they never clicked like, like schedule? Super variable. So some people chose the wrong doctor, some people chose the wrong date, some people never finished it in the first place and missed it early on in the task. Um, mm -hmm. It was highly variable. There wasn't one particular error that people were making, but they were making errors early. So some people were missing the lab result, right? Uh, particularly in the hand group. Uh, some people then were misinterpreting the provider message, and then some people had more functional problems in scheduling the appointment itself. And so the hand, no, and nobody in the hand group did this right. Zero people, zero people in the hand group did that, that right. Uh, for cognitive correlates, again, we didn't see much in the way of processing speed, but learning memory and executive functions, as well as attention and working memory, um, win the day. In particular, uh, learning and memory, once again, are associated. This particular measure was also strongly related to uh, medication management. Um, so this was a mock medication management task in which we give them a series of pill boxes and ask them questions and have them uh, dose out their pills. Uh, and it was not strongly related to any of the other everyday functioning measures that we gave, interestingly enough. Uh, these are small sample sizes, but the effect sizes that we're seeing 
are also uh, are also a little bit small. So related to one health related performance based task, but none of the others. It did relate pretty reliably to measures of health literacy. Uh, so strong correlations with overall health knowledge and people's ability to appraise and apply health related information. The application here is really more health related decision making sorts of tasks. Um, so we do see some uh, strong evidence there. The cool thing about this task was that although we didn't see correlations in the household tasks with HIV RNA, for the health tasks, both of them, this one and the one I'll describe to you next, both of them correlated with the amount of virus that they had in blood at the time of assessment. Uh, so there was a strong relationship and those effect sizes were in the medium range uh, with performance and the extent to which that the virus was actively replicating in their blood. Not surprisingly related to fewer years of education and some of the other self-report computer variables, but the hand effects, again, were independent of all of those factors. They didn't explain those relationships. So finally, we have an online pharmacy task that we use. Uh, and this one, we ask patients to request to refill a prescription, uh, fill a new prescription, including the insurance information that we have in their wallet. Uh, they have to activate a text reminder for in-store pickup uh, of that new medication. They have to confirm that text reminder and then check for possible interactions for the new prescription. And again, we see really big hand effects. Our HIV negative group and HIV positive group patients without hand do pretty well overall and comparably, but the hand group is off the map. Very large effect sizes. Okay, so take home points overall. Uh, uh, I'm starting to believe that online activities of daily living and health behaviors are measurable. So these are actually things that we can, we can quantify um, and relate to relevant clinical outcomes. So it's not just necessarily a vehicle for doing these sorts of tasks in everyday life, but also something that we as, uh, as, as clinical scientists can measure and use. And they're pretty cool because they're super naturalistic. One of the challenges that we have in my field at least is that a lot of our everyday functioning tasks are either self-report, so tell me how you're doing, and you can imagine the biases that come into play there, or they're very hands-on, more capacity tasks. So under ideal circumstances in the laboratory, how can you do in managing your medications or adding things up for a financial management task? So these are much more ecologically relevant and the challenge has always been extracting that information and making psychometric sense out of it that we can then relate to patient populations. <laughs> and so I believe that now that we can do that, the other thing that's pretty cool is that even mild neurocognitive deficits can interfere with patients' abilities to do these things. So our HIV patients, for the most part, were not demented. I think we only had two or three demented patients in this sample. Uh, and their impairments would be considered to be, in generally, one to maybe two standard deviations below the normative mean. So these aren't severely impaired patients that you could necessarily immediately pick up on in clinic. Uh, these are relatively subtle deficits. Future studies that we need to do, we need to first of all look at this in other populations. That's a slam dunk and obvious. I'm also very interested in other internet sorts of capacities, and this is where I'd be curious to hear from you guys about the types of things that you do in your daily lives or that you see your patients do in their daily lives on the internet that we can develop paradigms around. So right now we're developing a search paradigm where we're having patients uh, find a few facts related to a disease and then we're having them doing some disease-related problem solving. So imagine that you have uh, symptoms X, Y, and Z. Uh, go onto the internet and tell us what you think you might have and whether or not you would go to the doctor's office as a, as a consequence of that. And then we're breaking each of those steps down into their various components. So then we're going to show them, all right, imagine you entered these search terms and these links came up. Which ones would you choose and why? Then we're breaking it down to, okay, now imagine you've clicked onto this page and we're gonna show it to him for about five seconds. Would you read on or would you not read on? So breaking down the search uh, process uh, using, uh, using some theory into its various components to see where the breakdown might actually lie. We're also interested in the psychometrics of these things, right? How reliable are they um, and how valid are they? So we're gonna start to look uh, specifically at reliability and developing parallel forms um, so that we could use these things in clinical trials. Uh, and then finally, and arguably most importantly, whether or not we can do anything about it. So can we potentially modify website design or intervene with patients or maybe even both to help improve these sorts of outcomes? And of course, that's a nice thing to say, but way harder to actually do. So that's, uh, that's the work that we'll be taking on over the next few years.